Thank you, New York City orchestras and choirs, including our congregation, our unity and congregation in Brooklyn. Oh, how can I keep from singing? Every proposed reform, every moral deed is to be tested by whether and to what extent it contributes to the realization of the beloved community. When one cannot find the beloved community, she needs to take steps to create it. And if there is not evidence of the existence of such a community, then the rule to live by is to act so as to hasten its coming. To act so as to hasten its coming. How can I keep from singing? Josiah Royce wrote those words. Josiah Royce was a theologian in the late 1800s who first developed the idea of beloved community. The term was popular in seminaries by the 1950s when Martin Luther King Jr. was studying in Boston. The realization of the beloved community to act so as to hasten its coming. I, I have to say I'm uncertain many days if my actions have hastened the coming of beloved community. Have I done enough today, I wonder often, to inspire joy and justice as we begin our mission? Joy and justice, the twin threads that weave that tapestry of love we call community. So I wanna tell you another story about uh, another moment at a UU congregation. It's a story about a couple of teenage boys at a congregation I served. One day after church, they were hanging around bored while one of their moms attended one of those after church meetings, like many of us will stick around for today, bored and perhaps feeling some other unpleasant feelings. These boys decided it would be fun to find some eggs. I don't know where they got the eggs, maybe out of the kitchen and throw them around one of the RE rooms. A mess was made, an unpleasant, difficult to clean mess at church, in our, in our building, in our sanctuary home by our own people. But what heightened the feelings of everyone involved, what made this a moment was that these two boys were black, teens who were transracially adopted by white lesbian moms. And I remember just struggling, wondering, what do we learn in a moment like this about beloved community? I remember the tumult of feelings rippling through staff and members who knew about what happened. Harm had been done, a violation of sorts. But what did it mean that teenagers who came to youth group, whose moms were members of the congregation, would offer this small act of vandalism as their participation in our post-church meeting time. What did it mean? There's two qualities of building a beloved community that I'm wanting to lift up today. Breathing with and bearing witness. Breathing with and bearing witness. Stepping back to bear witness to this moment, one truth was clear. These boys, they did not feel in their bones that this church was their home. One does not egg one's own home. You might roughhouse in the sanctuary and accidentally chip the chalice because you're so comfortably at home there as I once did as a teenage boy. But yes, egging the place out of boredom and annoyance, no, not to your own home. They weren't the first or the last youth of any color to be dragged to church and feel alienated while there. 
when one cannot find the beloved community, she needs to take steps to create it. And if there's not evidence of the existence of such a community, then the rule is to act so as to hasten its coming. My eloquent colleague, the Reverend Victoria Safford says, the beloved community is not a goal or destination. And it was not any kind of idealistic Christian utopian dream, but instead a way of being spiritually, politically, economically, emotionally, intellectually. Beloved community is an attitude, an orientation of the heart. It's a disciplined understanding of your own relationship to other people. A disciplined understanding of your own relationship to other people, to everyone else on the planet, to every living thing. If you're religious, she says, this is a religious discipline and it goes by many names. If you're seeking spiritual wholeness, spiritual balance, it is a spiritual discipline. If you're an ethical humanist, it is a deliberate moral stance. It is a daily practice, a spiritual politics that requires inclusivity, nonviolence, and the hard discipline of radical hospitality. It requires, she says, love, agape. This is why we come to church, to participate in what the activist Grace Lee Boggs names a conspiracy of hope. A conspiracy of hope. We've seen this year in stark terms, the truth in the truism that church is the people, not the building. The people, not the building a disciplined understanding of your own relationship to other people. Our congregation had stuck together without being together, made phone calls and delivered meals, cooked soup, provided financial support to members in need, entertained each other's kids on Zoom, showed up at city and county meetings to agitate for justice in the wider community. I can't tell you how many meetings I've been at when someone asks, and what about all those we haven't seen in a while? How many people have we lost? Are we not in touch with because they're not on Zoom? Are we still staying connected to them? Conspiracy. A conspiracy of hope. Conspiracy means literally to breathe with. Conspira, right? With, with breathing, to breathe with. In my imagination, I always think of the group huddled around in the dark, arms around one another's shoulders, heads leaned close in, whispering together, literally breathing with, breathing one another's air. And it's funny thinking about this year in which we've not been breathing one another's air, when breathing with literally is the most dangerous of acts, yet on the phone and in Zoom meetings, we have continued to breathe with one another, continued to conspire. Why conspiracy? Why conspiracy with all its connotations of secrecy, of plot, of deception and danger? It's because if we're actually doing this thing right, it's a dangerous business building beloved community. There are powerful forces we're up against, powerful forces of empire, of colonialism and white supremacy, of patriarchy and capitalism that work to thwart the effort of beloved community. One of my favorite quotes about church is from Annie Dillard. She says, I want for the church to be a force that causes my life to change and causes me to change the world with my life. Church to be a force that causes my life to change and causes me to change the world with my life. When people come to church, she says, they should be not be handed an order of service with a smile, but should be given hard hats and life preservers because church should be a dangerous place, a zone of risk, a place of new birth and new life where we confront ourselves with not only who we truly are, but who we are called to become. I love that image, walking into church and being handed hard hats and life preservers. A dangerous place because church requires not only the pastoral, the phone calls and meals, the bearing witness to one another's lives, sharing our joys and sorrows, our life's journeys, 
not only the pastoral, but also the prophetic, the pursuit of a world transformed in the shape of justice, of lives made whole, made holy through a transformation of the world that will require us to change, to shed, to learn, to grow. The beloved community that beckons, the one that was so beautifully portrayed in that video we watched last week, it will require much of us. As much unlearning as learning, especially when it comes to matters of culture and race. I know our longings are one here. We long for our community to reflect the multicultural, multiracial vision of beloved community we know is possible. And we also know that we're a long way off, right? The barriers are steep and real. But we are getting clearer, I hope, I think, about why we are in this journey. Not to feel good about ourselves, not to be good folks who are overcoming our own racism, but to fulfill our thirst for justice, to conspire, to breathe with those who would bring about a new cultural era. Our UU anti-racist educator, Chris Crass, wonderful teacher puts it like this. He says, our goal is not to have white people sit alongside a person of color so as to affirm that those white people aren't racist. Our goal is to build and be part of beloved community, united to end structural oppression and unleash collective liberation in our faith communities, schools, neighborhoods, workplaces throughout society. Our goal is to join our hearts and minds to the task of destroying white supremacy in every worldview, policy, law, institution, and governing body of our society. For our faith communities to be places of healing from the nightmare of racism that haunts people of color and white people. For our faith communities to be places of nourishment, sustaining the multiracial struggles of our people to advance economic, racial, and gender justice. For our faith communities to be part of the continual process of working within the movement as part of the journey to end oppression in society. We breathe with and bear witness. Breathing with the beloveds we know, bearing witness to one another's stories, yet also continuing always to widen that circle of conspiracy, to join ourselves to the conspiracies already unfolding around us, the conspiracies of workers seeking protection in their workplaces, new laws passed, new policies created all the time right now to protect workers from unsafe environments with the spread of COVID. The conspiracy of elders in need of stable and affordable housing, all those in need of stable and affordable housing. The conspiracy of immigrants seeking homes free of terror and abject poverty. The conspiracy of integration, of breaking down the structures that keep our county the most racially segregated in the state to pursue beloved community. We go beyond allyship, beyond allyship. We've been working to become good allies in many ways, but we must go beyond that allyship and become co-conspirators, co-conspirators with those opposing the destructive forces of empire. Reverend Joanne Crawford writes that beloved community is not held within our church walls. We know that, we know that here on Zoom, but it's not even held within the bounds of our membership. As soon as you begin to think like that, she says, you have moved into the exact opposite of beloved community because in creating that definition of community, you have necessarily created otherness. There is the community inside our walls, the people who think like us, act like us, look like us, and there are the people who are not part of that community, the others. This is not beloved community, she says. 
and talking about that, that 19th century theologian. She says, Royce distinguished between small communities of grace, small communities of grace that were loyal to the greater cause of the universal beloved community and those that were insular, ones he named often predatory in their loyalty to their own, predatory in their loyalty to their own. Being a community of grace conspiring with a greater hope, a greater cause of the universal beloved community. I don't have a magic moment to share as the ending of, of the stories about the boys throwing eggs or Barry getting turned away from choir rehearsal. We gathered with the boys and their moms. They helped clean things up. We worked to connect them with adults in the congregation who might become mentors, supports. I texted one of them every week for a few months, but I can't say whether they'll remember the UU church of their teenage years as a blessing or a curse in their lives. Barry, of course, made his way to Star King to seminary. I hope, I, I hope he would have become a powerful UU minister. Sadly, he, he died suddenly and tragically during his first year there. So I won't know, I hope, but I, I also know that the history and the statistics are grim for the people of color who pursue professional ministry in our denomination. So I don't have a, a happy ending to share, but beloved community is not a goal of a happy ending. It's no destination to be arrived at, a status to be achieved. that state of being, that discipline, that practice of presence and relationship. It happens when we breathe with one another, when we bear witness, listening deeply to another's story, ever widening our circle of conspiracy. So the last word to the poet, this is Marge Piercy, The Low Road. What can they do to you? Whatever they want. They can set you up, they can bust you, they can break your fingers, they can burn your brain with electricity, blur you with drugs till you can't walk, can't remember. They can take your child, wall up your lover, they can do anything you can't stop them from doing. How can you stop them? Alone, you can fight, you can refuse, you can take what revenge you can, but they roll over you. But two people Fighting back to back can cut through a mob, a snake dancing file can break a cord and an army can be an army. Two people can give each other sane, can keep each other sane, can give support, conviction, love, massage, hope, sex. Three people are a delegation, a committee, a wedge. With four, you can play bridge and start an organization. With six, you can rent a whole house, eat pie for dinner with no seconds, and hold a fundraising party. A dozen make a demonstration. A hundred fill a hall. A thousand have solidarity in your own newsletter. Ten thousand power in your own paper. A hundred thousand your own media. Ten million your own country. It goes on one at a time. It starts when you care to act. It starts when you do it again and they said no. It starts when you say we and know who you mean. It starts when you say we and know who you mean. And each day 
mean one more. And each day, mean one more. May it be so, and amen.